Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the WandaVision press conference. And without further ado, I would like to welcome our moderator, who is a sitcom legend in his own right, Mr. Jaleel White. Holy smokes, the pressure is on. How goes it, everyone? I'm sure you're wondering, what is my connection to WandaVision? Well, your esteemed director, Matt Shackman, and I worked together as kids. And when I found out that he was doing something in the world of classic sitcom, personally insulted that I was not included, but Matt, being the gentleman that he is, said, Jalil, we would love to have you come and moderate for our press conference. And I thought that was really, really awesome. And I'm honored to be here. This is going to be such a wonderful time. I can't wait to hear all your questions. I've watched all three episodes. This is Marvel's first foray into the world of sitcom with the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. So uh, let's get right to it. I'm going to start introducing these, this wonderful cast. Um, Elizabeth Olsen. Hi. Hey, looking wonderful there. Um, Paul Bettany. Hey. I'm sure. Oh, I there am. he is. <laughs> there he is. Tiana Paris. Hi. We've got uh, Matt Shackman, my boy, our head writer and executive producer. Hi. And of course, we've got Kevin Feige, the head of all of this. Hello, everybody. I think we're missing somebody. Yes, I think we're missing someone. Who are we missing? Hey, oh, we oh, my God. Hey. <laughs> On my list, there's people to fire. Please contact okay. your agents. You're not on my okay. list. I, I, you're I'm not, not, not going to take it personally. <laughs> I'm not, I'm I'm not going to do I'm that. Just, I was just in the just sitting in the waiting room, <laughs> waiting, waiting to be seen. Let's get to uh, let's get to Elizabeth because I just loved your performance. I really, really did. Um, you, you, apparently, you shot the first episode though in front of a live studio audience. How did that affect your, your performance? It was the first thing we shot. It was so nerve wracking. There was a lot of adrenaline. There were a lot of quick changes. And um, it totally uh, confused my brain. I think, I mean, did you guys shoot in front of a live audience a lot? Of course, we shot 215 yeah. episodes in front of a live so, <laughs> so, Okay, <laughs> well, then I should have asked you for some tips because it really messed with my brain. The idea of not playing to an audience but feeding off an audience and having a camera. And um, I was really grateful when we added the fourth wall for our second episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna talk to Matt about that fourth wall though, but I, I think it's awesome. Uh, I miss quick changes. Ah, quick changes are great. I love the stress of them. Um, but um, I, I feel like you were drawing from either Elizabeth Montgomery or Lucille Ball, if not both. I mean, everything from your eye roll to your hand on your hip, you nailed it. <laughs> Which one do you think you pulled from more? I don't know. I think it was like an amalgamation of um, Mary Tyler Moore and Elizabeth Montgomery. And I think I accidentally threw in some Lucy in the 70s just because there was so much physical comedy. Well, I can tell you did your homework. You were awesome. <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to steal all the questions that people want to ask you, but you, you really you have my praise. Great job. Thank Great you. job. Uh, Paul Bettany, again, uh, your character is so off the chain. But what is it about vision that seems to hold true whatever his surroundings yeah, I was worried about that. Initially, I was like, wow, this is, feels so different as I read the script and how do I keep him the same? And then I realized he's always been becoming something else. You know, he's Jarvis, he's part Ultron, he's part Tony Stark and he's omnipotent, but he's also this sort of naive ingenue. Uh, and then I realized, well, I'll just throw a little bit of Dick Van Dyke in there and a little bit of Hugh Laurie and maybe Yay, a little, okay. little smidge of, you know. So um, as long as he remains, uh, I think what Vision is, is just decent and honorable and and exists for wonder. And uh, uh, and then you're safe. I'm not afraid to go there. Dick Van Dyke, that's a great reference for her. That's awesome, seriously. Um, human. So, but what does he need specifically to blend into his community? Oh, uh, a lot of wigs. <laughs> <laughs> Done. That, wigs I'm not I'm, if makeup job. <laughs> I'm not topping that answer. Catherine, the one I forgot, the amazing Agnes, saber like yourself. Um, have I? I, you know, I could use it. I, I have never had. Well, that's not true. We did have a neighbor that was very much like this as well, that would pop over unannounced and we tried to, we, we would definitely pretend to be excited to see them and it was always the worst timing. So yes, for sure. Pretend to be excited to see them. I love it. Do neighbors really even exist anymore today with phones and everything? Who knocks on someone's door other than Postmates? I know, I, I miss it. I do too. We've got a great, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Moving on down the line, Tiana. Um, welcome to the MCU. Uh, I know um, 
Can you tell us about Monica and her character? Yeah, I mean, we met Monica in Captain Marvel as a little girl. And basically in WandaVision, we pick up with who she is now as a grown woman. Uh, and through the course of the show, we find out what she's been up to, what's happened for her uh, between that gap in the years and how she's grown and evolved or or not. And <laughs> we just follow her along. Can you give us a hint of where we will see her again in November of 2022? Well, sure. For you, of course I will, Jaleel. Just we for me? Will, just for me? Just for you. <laughs> we will get to see Monica join Carol Danvers, uh, Captain Marvel, and Miss Marvel in Captain Marvel 2. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Nice. That definitely deserves some applause. These turkeys, how we know each other, man. Just well, get to it. <laughs> we were unceremoniously fired. Uh, we were on this show called Good Morning, Miss Bliss with Haley Mills that then got reconceived from middle school to high school and became Saved by the Bell. Wow. Is that right? That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I was Mario Lopez, of course. Um, <laughs> That's yeah, good no. TV trivia, Matt. I didn't know that. That's yeah. How did we make it through production without knowing that particular piece of trivia? We both yeah. went on to better wow. things, though, right? We it certainly did. But Way to bury the, the lead. <laughs> back in, that was back in the day when the great Brandon Tartikoff would handpick a kid and he picked us. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That is awesome sauce. Uh, tell us about the sitcom boot camp, though. You ran for this esteemed group of thespians. <laughs> well, we wanted to be as authentic as possible. That was one of the biggest goals. Um, and so production design, cinematography, costume, and everything was about going on this deep dive. And with the actors, we all wanted to do the same thing. So we watched just a ton of old television episodes, talked about how comedy changes, you know, because right. it really does. So the approach to comedy in the 50s, 60s, 70s is really different. And as Lizzie said, the doing it in front of a live studio audience, which is this weird quasi theater TV uh, thing is really, really adds to it. Lucille Ball, you know, I love Lucy, Dick Van Dyke. You can feel the energy of that kind of theatrical performance working with the audience. And then when you get into 60 shows like Bewitched or I Dream of Jeannie, um, it is a fourth wall. And all of a sudden, it's much more like doing a movie these days. And that laugh track is all canned and brought in. It changes the energy, the approach, the style, everything. So we also worked with a fabulous dialect coach uh, to talk, you know, to work on how the people would sound in that era, how they would move. Um, you know, we just did everything we could to make it as authentic as I, you really pulled me in by the time we got to the third episode, because then that's when I saw the sitcom, the visual motif change. And I was like, oh, OK, they're going to go through all of the sitcom look. So uh, how many have you gotten up to? Because I was only allowed to watch three. How many have you gotten up to? Have you gotten to the 80s? Have you gotten to Three's Company look now? Have you sped up the film? Have you gotten to, uh, have you gotten to it, the 90s? It goes pretty crazy. I wouldn't want to ruin it for everybody, but we definitely do take quite a trip. We take quite a trip. I love it. I love it. I love it. Who do we have next here? We have we have Jack Schaefer. Um, welcome. You're the Thanks. one I feel like I'm most nervous to talk to because clearly you have it all in your head. So it's like, what can I ask you? Um, but in many ways, Wanda Vision is a love story. So can you describe Wanda and Vision's journey to this point and what can we expect to see of, of their relationship? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that Wanda and Vision are really, as a couple, a fan favorite because their their love story has been so very tragic, but also really kind of warm and intimate. And we've seen them in these really beautiful kind of stolen moments in the MCU. It's actually been mm -hmm. a small amount of screen time, but very powerful and very um, soulful. And But what we have with WandaVision, which is really, I think, a treat for all, is we're sort of opening up the stage and the space for them and they're in this like domestic sphere um, mm -hmm. and we get to see them doing dish dishes and in the kitchen and being cute and and um, just all the sort of like homebody stuff that you would never get to see a, a superhero. Um, so we really go from these enormous sort of dramatic moments um, and kind of fraught moments in the MCU and then in WandaVision it's a lot of cute cute until it's not. Ah, yeah, I, I see that coming. I see that coming. Um, I have a question about dialogue. Um, writer to writer, I mean, you're on another level, but still, I have a question about dialogue. Um, you, you cover, the series goes from 50 sitcoms all the way to modern sitcoms. What were, the, what were the tools that you used to research the changing of dialect during that time? Yeah, I mean, that was- that specific dialect kind of in, in, in the beats. Yeah, it, it really was almost like doing like an accent or a period piece or something like that. Um, especially with the 50s and 60s, we would sort of compile these big 
um, lists of sort of sayings of the era. And then we had to have kind of a subsection for Paul that was kind of, which then once, you know, it was on its feet and we were doing it, you know, Paul had, had um, adjustments and improvements for, for all those sort of like little textural things. Um, so in the early ones, it, it, it genuinely was sort of a research thing that we were kind of plug and playing the expressions to make it um, really fun in that way. And then as we move forward, I mean, you know, the sitcoms of the eighties and that's just, that's just burned into my actual DNA. So that, that was not so much of a challenge. <laughs> which, which period of sitcom speech did you just find to be absolutely ludicrous? Like, I can't believe we really spoke, spoke this. Well, I think, I don't know about ludicrous, but the, um, but the, the fifties era, the sort of patter patter. Yeah. And also, you know, since we did it um, live, that sort of, and the, the rhythm of that, the sort of feeling yeah. like it was a play um, I hadn't done anything like that before. And it was, it was so much fun. It was just like laughing gas all the time. That's cool. I know when I saw the separate beds, I was like, is my daughter going to get this? Is she going <laughs> to understand that this actually was a thing? <laughs> all right. Kevin, thank you, man. Thank you for having me. This is great. Thanks for being here. So I can't, still can't believe it. It's awesome. This is, um, this is the first foray into sitcom for the, uh, for the MCU. What, uh, what other projects can we expect from this at, at the sitcom level? Uh, well, we'll see. This was our this was our test run. This was this was Marvel Studios. Marvel, of course, has had a lot of uh, uh, good, successful TV in the past. This was Marvel Studios' first foray, and and directly with cast and amazing characters that we'd seen in movies uh, coming on to television. And the idea always was yes to do something that could not be done uh, as a feature that uh, that uh, 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 plays with the format and plays with the with the medium. And there were a lot of meetings before people actually sort of understood what we were trying to go for. And, yeah. uh, and we're only sitting here because Jack and Matt did. And, uh, and we're able to turn a, a wacky idea into a spectacular show. Uh, and we've got lots of other things we've announced that, that is coming up. But, but as, uh, as it all came together, I'm actually very happy and it worked out perfectly that this is the debut on Disney Plus for, uh, for the MCU. Awesome. Well, typically a great sitcom is about the chemistry between its leads. So the chemistry between Paul and Elizabeth jumps off the screen. You should be excited about that. I'm going to ask our, uh, our first question, though. And uh, Courtney Howard from Fresh Fiction TV. I'm curious, you spoke about the inspiration for the actors. You spoke about the inspiration uh, where you pulled from and also the dialect. But I'm curious if the decades changing each episode, I'm curious if your approach to adapting the physicality of your performance um, to suit each era was an added challenge. Let's give that one to Paul. Let's give that one to Paul. I think Paul okay. has the most physicality. Mr. Dick Van Dyke over here. Yeah, it's a better question for uh, uh, Elizabeth and, and Tiana and Catherine, but <laughs> I will attempt to. Um, I think there is a lot more uh, slapstick and physical comedy early on. Luckily, by the time we, um, we get to the 90s, um, they've all made me look so ridiculous that I didn't really have to work that hard for laughs, I think. <laughs> Love it, I love it. <laughs> Elizabeth, what do you have to say to this? I, I think absolutely. I mean, the way the way women move throughout the decades uh, changes so much when it comes to um, what society wants from them. And so we do. We do, Jack did write in quite a few nods to um, how those were evolving throughout the decades. In the sixties, she gets to wear some pants, um, and that would adjust how someone moves through space. And um, manners were a big part of when we talk about vocal work and, and speech and cadence, um, manners were a huge part of every decade. And so we would get this book um, of manners for the time as well. Um, but we also have to remember that we're not depicting an honest um, reality of the 60s or the 70s. We are depicting the, the, the sitcom reality. reality, which is its own set of rules. <laughs> Absolutely. I think Catherine wants to jump in here. I can, I can feel it. Oh, I mean, I would just, I, I'm just echoing, I was just, I was just yessing uh, uh, Lizzie, but it's same thing. I mean, I, I, I feel like the, this, this, what the sitcom has always represented is this kind of like aspirational 
um, view, this kind of like um, this comfortable like ideal. And so not only are we trying to to what the trick was, not only were we trying to be to, to, to just kind of like live within each decade, but kind of like present this kind of like this kind of comfortable ideal, like what what would, you know, the structure of a sitcom, which is that like the setup, the misunderstanding and the resolution is like, is such a comfortable, comf- comforting little s- structure that we, I mean, I know I have even just like seeing your mug and seeing Matt, like that is something that we have just like baked in us, mm-hmm. I think as, as, you know, I'm a kid of the eighties, like that's just like baked in. And so to, to this trick was to not to like satirize it, but to kind of like get inside of each one. And that's, that's what I think was such tonally, such a trick to pull off, which I'm, I'm still so blown away by Matt and by Jack, by, by being able to do that. Cause that's difficult tonally. Definitely some good synergy going on between Matt and Jack. We'll, we'll touch on that. I'll let the other people ask these questions. Uh, Marianne Morisara. Hi, uh, Marianne Morisara, we start São Paulo, Brazil. Uh, I'd like to ask Kevin, um, of course, this is kicking off phase four, and uh, it wasn't the original plan, right? But uh, was there any trepidation in uh, starting things with a bold show like this, a different one, and all, with a show <laughs> for starters? And also, uh, but do you think that Marvel fans are maybe more o- open to risks right now? And what does it say about, you know, like phase four in general? Well, I hope it says, uh, you know, get ready for for the new and the different. And I hope all of our all of our um, uh, movies have said that one after the other over the years. But certainly with the Disney Plus um, opportunities, it has allowed us to expand um, creatively what we do. Yes, the original plan was Falcon and the Winter Soldier was going to debut first uh, last year, followed very soon behind with with WandaVision. So creatively, it didn't reshuffle. Part of part of um, uh, having a long lead plan is having the ability and the ideas of how to shuffle should the need arise. I'm not saying we were prepped for a global pandemic. Uh, we were not, <laughs> but um, uh, we've always over the past uh, uh, 12, 15 years of Marvel Studios been able to shuffle around. This required no shuffling whatsoever in terms of the creative, um, uh, just in terms of the, just in terms of production. And as is often the case, um, when you're throwing curveballs, this is a sports reference, so I'll stop right there because I'll blow it. But but uh, uh, w- uh, the unexpected has often served uh, Marvel Studios well, and it has served us well in this, this case because this show being our first one, I love how bold it is. I love how different it is. And I love, as I said before, it is something you could only see on uh, Disney Plus, that we have things that you will only be able to see initially in theaters. We have things that could end and are made for that. And this is very much made to, uh, to be seen week after week on, uh, on television, uh, which is very different for us and was very fun. And it is as bold as it comes, thanks to uh, everyone you're looking at here today. Let's, uh, let's move on to Rory Cashin, Love in Dublin. Uh, this is for Matt, Jack and Kevin. Um, with all the sitcom references and homages are entirely there, entirely obvious. When it comes to the mystery and the darker aspects of the show, what were the references and inspirations for those? Well, we often talked about when we were in our period sitcoms that when something shifted from say a Dick Van Dyke or an I Love Lucy style into something that was outside of that, that it was going into kind of a twilight zone. You know, we were thinking about what were the period shows that addressed, you know, the odd and the strange and how could we embrace that? So that's a little bit about how we approach the the shooting of it, certainly in the look of it. Yeah, absolutely. Twilight Zone is um, an enormous influence on me personally. Um, I really think that's actually kind of how I learned to tell stories, Twilight Zone. Um, and it was so incredibly um, um, deft at, at, that, at that turn, right? You think you're in one sort of thing and then suddenly it's flipped on its head. And so um, we were all incredibly enamored of that. Um, and then I think there are a lot of um, current shows right now, um, like prestige series that are, are doing this very exciting thing where you watch a couple episodes and you think the show is one thing and then um, and then by episode four or five, it flips the script. So um, that's really, I think, where the more contemporary references come in in terms of um, kind of boundary pushing. In All right, I think that answers that question. Let's go on to uh, Shannon McGrew, Nightmarish Conjuring. This is Shannon McGrew. So my question is for um, 
I guess, Pat or Kevin, back. Um, can you give us a little clue or insight the Hydra and commercials? Well, yeah, Jack and Matt should take that. That was that was part of something early on. Well, it's not a it, yes. There, there. How is the other truths of the show beginning to leak out? And commercials was an early idea for that. And uh, and if this is the very first uh, Marvel uh, MCU thing you're watching, it's just a strange. It's just a strange uh, version of a '50s commercial or '60s commercial that uh, that you'll have to keep watching the series to understand. If you have been watching all the movies. Um, you might be able to start connecting what those things mean to the to the past. Um, you know, I have a, a question I want to pull from the chat. The chat is just lit over here. I don't know if you guys can see it. I feel like they're not getting any love. Um, Matt, um, how challenging was it, though, to pay homage to the evolution of sitcom without avoiding, um, without appearing tone deaf since comedy and society have changed so much? So let me let me rephrase that. Was there anything specifically where you said, listen, simply because it doesn't translate from the 50s. Uh, yeah, for sure. We did consider that. I mean, I think that, that so much of that is in the writing. I think probably Jack could answer better about um, the reference. I'm that question, by the way. I didn't leave you out. I was coming to you next. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Yeah, about what she was choosing sort of early on to sort of build. I mean, as, um, as Catherine mentioned earlier, um, the key reference points are family sitcoms. I mean, there are so many legendary sitcoms throughout time, but Taxi doesn't really relate to this show, you know, yeah. so Brady Bunch does, you know, there are key reference points that were about this idea of family. And I think that oftentimes um, does age pretty well. And I think also the key references that we were looking at are those miraculous shows that have managed to be, they were timely and timeless. You know, they resonated in their moment. And somehow you watch the Dick Van Dyke show today, and it's just as good as it was back then. Yep. You know, so what's the magic behind that? And I remember Kevin and I had this amazing lunch with Dick Van Dyke that remains one of the great afternoons of my life. And we asked him, you know, what was the sort of governing principle behind the Dick Van Dyke show? Why did it work so well? And he said, if it couldn't happen in real life, it can't happen on the show. Right. So if you're drawing something that's grounded and it's real and it's resonating with everyone's experience at home, um, you can do crazy things. You can tumble over our Ottomans. You can be goofy. You can be anything. But as long as it's grounded in real life, um, that makes it work. So I think a lot of the reference points that we gravitated were those kind of. Jack, what about you? Something that you said, I don't care. This is my show. It's tone deaf and we're not doing it. I don't care if it was in the 50s. Um, yeah, what everything that Matt said uh, was incredibly well articulated. Um, yeah, you know, when we look back and we were doing our research and, and looking at these older shows there, um, there, you know, there were shows that um, that were a little disappointing um, and that were not acceptable for today. Um, and, you know, we had a very... Um, a really incredible writers room full of people who are part of our job was to keep an eye on these things. Um, and as Matt said, um, fairly quickly, we zeroed in on family sitcoms. Um, and it, you know, there are a lot, there are a lot of different sort of workplace sitcoms and other types of sitcoms. Um, but the family piece sort of kept us very, very centered. Um, and then, you know, I, I can't speak to sort of the larger puzzle of what the show is. But that was also a piece that that um, that kept us, uh, I think, on, on the right track. Steve Ervolino. <laughs> Hi to everybody. Hi to Purple Daddy, uh, Paul Batney. How are you? <laughs> um, I wanted to ask uh, Kevin, what was uh, behind the inspired casting of Katherine Hahn to uh, join the MCU? It was one of those miraculous uh, things that happened. In my memory, Catherine, maybe it was over the course of months. In my, in my memory, it all happened very quickly. It was a rare general meeting, which we don't usually have a lot of time to do. But Catherine came in and sat down with uh, Luigi Esposito uh, and... And she was she was a fan of, of what we were up to. And and we're fans of hers. And at exactly that same time, we were sitting, I think, in that writer's room trying to think of who to play Agnes. And there was it probably took, you know, should have taken two seconds and it took five seconds for somebody to say, wait, what about Catherine? She was in yesterday. And we don't usually cast like that. It's not usually like who came in the other day? Let's cast them. It's almost never like that, as a matter of fact. But it's usually never as perfect as this. Um, and. And I think it happened very, very quickly. And it also, I don't want to speak for Jack, but I think also solidified the voice of the character and kind of, and kind, I almost said something I shouldn't. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, who is the greatest nosy neighbor uh, uh, in the world right now? And uh, not in real life, Catherine, I'm not sure about that, but at least uh, on, on screen. Tim Lammers, Looper.com. 
Hello, everybody. Thanks for doing this today. Uh, Kevin, a lot of people have observed that John Favreau and Filoni have adopted the MCU's unique way of universe sharing in constructing The Mandalorian. And, and clearly that approach is going to be applied to future Star Wars. Now, while that and while the MCU rooted in those same storytelling sensibilities, I'm wondering if there is something that you saw in the making of The Mandalorian that was interesting and applied it in to WandaVision in any sort of way. Well, WandaVision, I think WandaVision, we were all underway on WandaVision before, long before we saw The Mandalorian. There is lots and lots um, uh, of The Mandalorian that has inspired us at Marvel Studios, not the least of which is the stagecraft uh, technology that, they're, that they pioneered that we're using on some upcoming uh, project. I think though, in terms of, it was wonderful to see um, the amazing job that Disney did and Disney marketing did in eventizing that. Um, one of the things I was always um, concerned about was to say anything that we do, we want to eventize. We want to make people understand these projects on Disney plus are as important as the projects going into, into theaters. And we want to feel that same excitement and the Disney marketing team is best in the world, uh, best of all time, frankly, right now, the group running it that, um, uh, that can do that. And they certainly showed that uh, they can do that uh, uh, spectacularly on Disney Plus with, with Mandalorian. And also the fun week, week to week, uh, the discussion, which I guess happens on all week to week television, but uh, uh, sometimes series drop all at once on uh, streaming services. And Disney, I think, was very smart to do the week by week because that conversation that happens every week uh, between episodes, I think, is very important and, and frankly, just a lot of fun. And so each time I witnessed that and experienced that and joined in that, uh, with Mandalorian, it got me excited for the way WandaVision, we had already been building WandaVision to, to, uh, to uh, be unveiled. A guy named uh, Orlando Maldonado uh, had a wonderful question that I thought that he deserved to answer. And how does Wanda's powers, how do they translate differently in the sitcom world? How are you able to explore her powers specifically in the sitcom world in a way that you wouldn't have explored them in uh, the normal interview? Uh -huh. Well, I can't wiggle my nose, so we had to figure out something else that was period appropriate. <laughs> See, I, I do like it. <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of <laughs> was our translation, and to watch our special effects team that usually, you know, blow things up, set things on fire, create wind, create smoke. These guys became like puppeteers. Um, of things floating in the sky and dealing with magnets uh, in different ways to make things spin. And it was just so incredible to watch our special effects team adapt to the era specific ways of creating these practical effects by doing the research of what did they do on Bewitched or even as stupid as like, you know, holding still and doing a quick change and trying to remember your body for the camera. I mean, there's just a lot of silly things that we got to do that, you know, I'm used to um, it all just coming together in CGI. So it was really fun to have the practical effects there. We've got a question from Jana Nagasi. Did I say that correct? Am I still phonetically gifted? And that question is for Elizabeth. I want to know from v Wanda's point of view, how she would describe WandaVision? Um, I believe from Wanda's point of view, she would describe um, WandaVision as a family sitcom of two people trying to um, fit in and um, not be discovered for being different. Let's pull you more. Thanks for joining us. This is for Tiana and Kat this is for Tiana and Catherine. Um, WandaVision is going to be one of the first chances that people have to see what life on Earth is like for relatively, quote unquote, normal people on the ground who have lived through everything that we've sort of seen in the larger MCU. Um, from your perspectives, how have Monica and Agnes's experiences really shaped, you know, their lives as they head into WandaVision and future Marvel books or projects? The last time that we saw Monica, she was a kid in the 90s. And, you know, and now in the present day, presumably she's seen everything. It's like, oh, Lord, the aliens are here. There's people from another dimension. Half the universe got snapped out of existence. And here we are now. And it's all very, it's all very chill when the things begin. But obviously, prior to ending up in Westview, she's gone through some things, both Monica and Agnes. And so I'm curious to hear from you both, like, what kind of people they are, even before we see them, you know, dropped into the middle of a twisted reality. Definitely been through some things and seen some things. And it's actually really cool that you bring that up because we actually do get to learn 
particularly what those things are that Monica has seen and gone through and how they have shaped her life. So I don't want to give too much away because we will actually touch a lot on that through the course of the show. But great question. Thank you. A really great question. I would say the same thing. I would say um, I would say the same thing. And I would also say like in, the, in all those classic sitcoms, like, you know, you never, you, you always, there's always that person that busts through the doors and, and sits on the couch, but, and you never like, it's like their personal life. <laughs> you never get to know anything about them. They're there. So I think that we, I, I think in that classic way, it's, it's, that's, um, I was able to walk into it as, as Agnes, just like with all those beautiful um, tropes set up behind me to just, to just build on. You know, it's what we don't know about our favorite sitcom characters that keeps us coming back for more. We never met Urkel's parents. We never met Norm's wife. Right? We never met Urkel's parents. That's, that's just part of the I want to know Urkel's family. <laughs> um, last question, Charles Murphy. Thank you guys for taking this. And I, I want to say that uh, having seen all three episodes and hearing you guys talk about what you put into it, I want, I want you to know that it worked. I watched the episodes twice and I absolutely loved all the details and I'm, it was brilliant. It really is. <clears throat> um, I have one for Kevin and uh, actually I have a backup in case you say no, but <laughs> um, I know we just talked about WandaVision kicking off phase four with all the shuffling that's been going on with uh, the, the release late changing and then some of the announcements. Could you clarify where phase four kind of ends at this point? No. <laughs> All right. Uh, I like that, I do backup, that was the backup question. Uh, so the backup, the backup question, uh, we, we, you guys just did talk quite a bit about Dick Van Dyke. And well, uh, what we were researching and thinking about what to talk to you about, we noticed that your late grandfather, Robert Short, worked as an executive on the show for like five years. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about how that might have led to this project and how special it is to you maybe to get to pay tribute to him in this way. Well, it is special. He, my, my grandfather worked for Procter and Gamble, um, and Procter and Gamble was both the, back in the day uh, sponsor and producer on uh, on mainly soap operas. But in the early early like fifties and sixties, I think they did some uh, prime time. Uh, so I don't know that he was actually on the show, but he was on the the company behind one of the sponsors and companies behind the show, uh, and. Uh, uh, that might have had a little to do with that. I mean, there, there's something fun that has happened. It mainly is I watched too much TV as a kid, and uh, and TV meant a lot to me, and I found comfort in uh, in television families. There's one thing we talked about early on is these are not parodies. This is not um, direct satire. We love these things, and they meant a lot uh, uh, to us, dated and silly uh, as they may seem now. Um, there's a comfort factor there. Uh, and... So that was the primary factor behind, um, uh, and and the, the comic I inspiration, of course, is what is what led us to to putting putting these ideas together. There is a wonderful thing though that happened with uh, Matt's background, as he's talked about, which is so which is so amazing. Lizzie's uh, background with her sisters, which didn't even occur to me until I think we were standing in the writers' room with pictures of Full House on the wall, and I went, "Oh, right," um, and. Yes, the connection with my grandfather going going way back, and even you know the people that that uh, oversee um, Marvel Studios and created Disney Plus. Bob Iger ran ABC. I think Julia, he was uh, very influential in uh, putting uh, putting Family Matters uh, on the air. Uh, that was my direct boss. Bob would take me to the Four Seasons yep. of Doheny for breakfast, and I should have asked him for more money back then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's uh, uh, he's our direct boss as well, and so that was just a funny connection. Being in these in these meetings, and Alan Horn um, uh, uh, ran some of the greatest, biggest uh, sitcoms uh, um, of all time, and uh, and it's a certain point, Matt included, and this was everybody's past, and it was fun to hear stories as uh, as we uh, as we worked on this series about all these people that we work with every day, um, and getting an insight into into a bit of uh, of where they'd come from. My grandfather uh, being one of them. That was a good all. That was a good backup question. It was a damn good backup question because yeah. that flat out no came quick. <laughs> flat out no came quick. <laughs> like a true CEO. Listen, um, this has been absolutely fantastic, you guys. I have really enjoyed uh, everyone's knowledge of of sitcom history. I mean, it, it, to talk just sitcom history with this crew of people would actually be a fun thing to do at a, at a later date. But uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for having me as your host. And uh, 